TXRX cavity filters are used in RF design to form the building blocks for combiners, and one of the basic components of RF filters are coupling loops. They come in different shapes and sizes and configurations, but there are some general characteristics that apply to all types of loops. In this section of RF basics, we will cover the concepts and theories of couplers and how these specialized couplers called loops work in cavity filters and then in RF combiners. First, a basic concept. Loops are couplers, coupling land mobile radio communications into and out of cavities that are then built into combiners. Topics in this section on coupling loops include Basics on coupling loops are covered on slides 3 and 4. Bandpass coupling loops are on slides 5 through 8. Series notch coupling loops are covered in slides 9 through 11. Very notch coupling loops are on slides 12 through 14. T-pass coupling loops are discussed on slide 15. And classes and contact information are included on the final slide, slide 16. The parts of a bandpass cavity are shown here. The main elements are the cavity itself, made up of the shell and bottom cap. The top part of the cavity is the mounting plate for other components, the main probe assembly, a fine tuning rod if used, and the coupling loops. Cavities may have slightly different appearances and construction, and the loops used in them will be different depending on what type of filter or cavity is needed. Newer versions of cavity filters and combiners have been and are being developed, but the physics and operation of cavity filters and coupling loops remains the same. The coupling loops shown are bandpass loops, allowing a certain range of frequencies to go through while blocking or attenuating others outside the passband range. The loops in a cavity work like antennas, with one loop being the transmitter and the other the receiver sending the signals through the cavity. The operating characteristics of a filter are changed by using interchangeable coupling loops. Each loop and cavity are also adjustable for various frequency bands and pass or reject characteristics. Three different types of loops are shown here, the bandpass loop, a very notch loop, and a series notch loop. An example of the filter response curve is shown for each, and each has specific applications. Rotating the loops in their mounting sockets changes coupling of the cavity, while adjusting the cavity's tuning rod changes the frequency response. The bandpass loop has a single connector on it. One end is connected to the signal source on the center pin, and the other end is connected to the loop plate or ground. The response is a simple bell curve, as seen on the graph, with the least amount of rejection or loss at the peak of the curve and more attenuation or reflection off-center. Two loops are used in a bandpass cavity. The very notch loop has two connectors and a small tuning capacitor, which allows the loop to be tuned for a passband and adjacent notch. A single loop is used for each very notch cavity. The tuning capacitor is adjusted to change the notch frequency after the cavity is tuned using the cavity tuning rod. The series notch loop is used to block signals by being tuned for high impedance at the notch frequency. The loop has two connectors and a tuning capacitor like the very notch loop and allows the notch frequency to be adjusted in depth while basic tuning is performed with the tuning rod assembly. Different types of cavities are constructed by using the same shell and then changing the loops. Illustrated here are a cavity and a pair of bandpass loops inserted into the cavity openings. The shell is drilled with three screw holes around the loop openings so that once tuning is done, the loops are locked down by tightening the screws. The center frequency of the cavity is set using the tuning assemblies. The loops should be set to the insertion loss values provided by the combiner design, keeping in mind that isolation and insertion loss are linked. The higher the required isolation, the higher the insertion loss.
system isolation requirements are determined by channel spacing and the presence of any known high-level carriers coming in on the antenna. A calibration index is provided next to the loop opening for reference in setting the loops with a reference dot or mark on the loop plate. The tuning rod may need touched up due to interaction of loops and rods. The orientation of the loops with respect to the fields in a cavity will determine overall selectivity and insertion loss. When the loops are perpendicular to the center line of the cavity as on the left, coupling is increased and insertion loss is decreased. The cavity will have lower selectivity, meaning that the response curve flattens out giving lower rejection at nearby frequencies. When the loops are parallel to the center line of the cavity, as on the right, the coupling is decreased, resulting in higher insertion loss, but maximum selectivity. This is the trade-off when using bandpass cavities. The higher the selectivity, the higher the insertion loss. The orientation of the loops determines the coupling of energy into the cavity and isolation from nearby signals that the cavity can offer. The tighter the coupling, the lower the Q of the cavity. The higher the Q of the cavity, the sharper the selectivity. Loops can be rotated to change Q or selectivity of the cavity. As the Q is increased, the insertion loss will also increase. Coupling loops are normally adjusted by the factory and should not be field tuned without the proper training and equipment. Bandpass filters are characterized by steep skirts on either side of a center frequency. Bandwidth is normally a few hundred kilohertz, but this depends on the Q or quality factor of the filter, which is determined both by the physical size and construction of the cavity. The larger the cavity, the lower the insertion loss and the better the isolation. The trade-off is that larger cavities cost more and take up more space. Insertion loss will depend on the Q of the filter and may vary from a few tenths of a dB to several dB. The cavity at its center or resonant frequency will have an impedance of 50 ohms, and the impedance will increase at frequencies further from the center. While some of the unwanted energy is absorbed by the cavity, most of it will be reflected back to the source due to the impedance mismatch off center frequency. The response curve shown indicates that the cavity and loops have 1.6916 dB of insertion loss on the upper graph and markers and 27.403 dB of return loss on the lower graph. The loss of the cavity increases on either side of the center frequency. The graph shown here is a network analyzer sweep of the frequency response of the bandpass loops in an 11711 cavity. Beginning at the topmost blue curve, the loop is set for half a dB of insertion loss at the center frequency of 406 MHz. At 1 MHz away, at either 405 or 407 MHz, signals going through the cavity would be attenuated by 10 dB, while the main carrier is attenuated half a dB due to the insertion loss of the cavity. Further away, at 3 MHz on either side of 406, the cavity response graph shows 20 dB of rejection of signals at 403 and 409 MHz. If more isolation was needed, the loops could be set for the higher insertion loss. Using the 3 dB red line of the response curves, there would be approximately 27 dB of isolation or rejection at 405 and 407 MHz and approximately 36 dB at 403 and 409 MHz. The carrier and channel would be attenuated by 3 dB with the cavity and loops set up this way, but if the additional isolation was needed, this would be the loop setting to use. A notch or reject cavity has only one loop assembly with both the input and output connectors on the loop plate. A small cover is placed in the unused opening. Nothing should ever be placed in the other hole except the cover plate.
The cavity tuning rods are used to adjust the notch frequency of the cavity. The series notch loop has a small capacitor that allows the passband insertion loss to be adjusted. As the capacitor is tuned, the curve will become asymmetrical, giving a steeper curve on one side of the notch frequency or the other. Improvements on one side of the curve will be at the expense of the other side. The greater the slope of the curve on one side of the notch, the less the slope will be on the other side. Rotating the loop adjusts the notch depth. Adjusting the capacitor adjusts the pass frequency. Series notch loops come in different loop sizes and configurations depending on frequency and desired response. The series notch filter is designed to attenuate a narrow band of frequencies while allowing other frequencies to pass with only slight attenuation. It is the opposite of a bandpass filter. A notch cavity acts like a series tuned circuit and gets its name, series notch, from its circuit arrangement. RF energy at the center frequency of the notch enters the cavity and is reflected back out of phase with the original. This creates a short circuit on the transmission line and results in a high percentage of the RF at the center frequency being reflected. Maximum attenuation occurs at this point, with all other frequencies being attenuated less depending on their distance from the center. The spacing between the desired frequency and the frequency to be notched can be a few megahertz or 100 kilohertz or less depending on the cavity's Q. If the attenuation obtained is not adequate, several notch filters can be added to improve performance. To read the graph presented, picture a carrier at 460 megahertz. At this point, our signal is attenuated approximately one dB due to insertion loss. Following the blue solid line, any carrier 175 kilohertz away will be attenuated by 15 dB. As the legend shows, if the notch frequency is set for 250 kilohertz away, the insertion loss decreases by about a quarter of a dB, but the notch is still 15 dB. If the 20 dB loop setting is used in the cavity, the notch depth stays at 20 dB for the frequency spacings given. Many times system designs will be dictated by the channel spacing within a system and by carriers coming in from the outside. Obviously, there is a great advantage to being able to notch out an incoming signal that causes receiver descents. These TXRX filters are flexible, tunable, and offer a relatively low loss to the frequency needing protection. TXRX very notch loops create a notch response, which attenuates a specific frequency. The loop shown is one of several designs based on frequency, loss, and notch requirements. Only one loop is used, so be sure that a cover plate is in the open port. The pass frequency of a very notch cavity is changed by adjusting the tuning rod length. The capacitor on the loop assembly changes the notch frequency. Be sure to use a non-conductive or insulated tuning tool. Rotating the loop assembly adjusts cavity insertion loss. Adjust the notch last as any changes will be impacted by the main tuning rod adjustments. Very notched loops have an input connector marked with a red dot on the plate to indicate the connector for best response. If a deeper notch is needed, multiple very notched cavities can be used. The connector with the dot is connected to the incoming signal and the unmarked connector is connected to the next cavity's input connector. As in all cavity filters, insertion loss is cumulative. So three cavities, each having 1.2 dB of insertion loss, would result in a total of 3.6 dB between the first input connector and the last output connector. Very notch loops have a bandpass filter response with an adjacent notch, all in one filter. Loops for these filters are available in either low pass or high pass varieties, but once the technician has become familiar with the very notch response, it is possible to flip the response of the filter by adjusting the notch frequency to become either a low pass or a high pass filter.
Very notch response is described as a bandpass with a rejector notch with a wide frequency range and as having a second untuned notch on the opposite side of the pass response. Very notch filters or loops can be set for close frequency range as close as 150 kHz away from the pass frequency. Spacing is determined by frequency band and by cavity size. Several very notch response curves are illustrated, showing the response at different isolation points. The pass frequency for all curves is 460 MHz, showing less than 1 dB of insertion loss at that point. The pass frequency remains constant while the notch frequency is changed. As the separation between pass and notch frequencies widens, the notch depth deepens. As the legend indicates, the green curve shows approximately 14 dB of notch at 460.250 MHz, with depths improving to approximately 23 to 24 dB at 460.500 and 33 to 34 dB at 461 MHz. A strong signal coming in at 462 MHz could be notched nearly 43 dB using a very notch cavity filter. As noted previously, there is a slight notch response on the lower side of the bandpass for this filter. The final loop covered is the T-pass loop. The TXRX T-pass combiner was one of the basic combiner types covered in the first unit on Combiner Basics. Using a T-pass loop in the final output of each channel, the channels are linked to the previous and next channel up the stack summing the entire combiner output onto a single feed line and on through to the transmit antenna. As shown on the top plate of a T-pass cavity, one loop is a bandpass loop and the other is a T-pass loop. One of the ports of the T-pass loop in the first cavity will have a short installed. Through the use of frequency-specific cable lengths, the short is reflected up the stack to each T-pass cavity. T-pass filters and loops have a bandpass response. The cavities are tuned to the channel frequency being passed using the cavity tuning rod assemblies and insertion loss is adjusted through the rotation of the loop. Thank you for being part of this training presentation. This section was intended as an introduction to the parts of a combiner, coupling loops, and how they are used in land mobile radio systems. More training modules are available in support of this and other topics specific to products manufactured by TXRX Systems. The material is available in short versions and in longer half-day, full-day, and two-day classes. Visit our website at txrx.com for more information about classes. Titles and topics are being added weekly, so please come back often to see what is available. Classes are also available at TXRX Systems 8625 Industrial Parkway in Golden, New York. Or if your group or shop is large enough, we will bring the training to you. Please call 716-549-4700 to discuss fees and scheduling. Again, thank you for being part of this presentation, and we do invite you back.